need of a savior. But sin does look different. Some of it's very obvious and some is more subtle. It's sins of the heart. That's really what sin is. It's two things. It's rebelling against God and it's settling for less than God's best. We see that all through the scriptures. In the Pentateuch, the first book of the Bible, we saw that God had perfect man, perfect woman, perfect environment. He was living with them in the garden. And he said, one simple rule, don't eat from that tree. They rebelled and settled for less than God's best. He called one man, Abraham, and made him a great nation. He said, go into the land. And got, the people said, oh no, there are giants in the land. They rebelled and the whole generation died. They finally got into the land and God said, I am your king. And they said, oh no, we want a human king like all the other nations. They rebelled and settled for less than God's best. And every time we rebel, there is judgment. And God said the judgment would be the, the country divided. There was the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. And eventually, both of them were exiled. God never judges his people without a warning, however. So all those years of those 17 history books that we have studied, God sent prophets. There were 17 prophets. The one we're looking at today is Isaiah. If you look at your prophet chart, you will see that Isaiah was not the first prophet to write. He wrote in 740 B.C. There were actually five other prophets that wrote before him. Isaiah was an educated man. He lived in Jerusalem. His wife was a prophetess. He had two children, and tradition says that he was a cousin of King Uzziah. If you turn with me to chapter 1, verse 1, Isaiah makes it very plain that he's concerned about Judah. And he also tells us in this verse that he saw the reigns of four kings. He says he saw the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And he wastes no time telling us what the problem of the people is. The end of verse 2, he says, they have revolted against me. In verse 4, he says, they're a sinful nation, people weighed down with iniquity. They have acted corruptly. They've abandoned the Lord. They've despised the Holy One of Israel. They've turned away from Him. They continue in rebellion. That's a pretty good picture of what sin is. It's rebelling against God. It's going our own way instead of God's way. They turn from Him. It says they despised Him. God says, if you love me, you'll obey me. So if we don't obey, we actually despise God. And it says it weighed them down. In the same chapter 1, verse 11, he says that even though these people were rebelling against God, they looked very religious. Look at verse 11. What are your multiplied sacrifices to me, said the Lord? I have had enough of your burnt offerings. I take no pleasure in the bull blood of bulls or lambs or goats. In verse 13, he says, bring your worthless offerings no longer. Your incense is an abomination to me. I hate your new moon festivals and your feasts. They're a burden. He says, you keep praying these multiple prayers, and I'm not even going to listen. Now, what's the problem? They are so religious. They're going through all this ritual, the praying and the festivals and the feasts and the sacrifices. But look at verse 16. He says, wash yourselves. Remove the evil from your deeds. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Reprove the ruthless, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. In other words, all their religion was not tra translating into a right relationship with God or people. They weren't living right. Verse 18 is our memory verse. He says, come now, let us reason together. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. That verse really summarizes this book of Isaiah because this book is the Bible in miniature. You know that the Bible has 66 books, right? 39 Old Testament about sin and judgment. 27 New Testament about the coming of the Savior.
the book of Isaiah is exactly the same. It has 66 chapters. The first 39 are about judgment, rebellion, the need for a savior, and the last 27 are about that savior to come. In chapter five, he calls them a vineyard. And he says he planted this vineyard and he did everything necessary to make them fruitful. He picked the choicest plants. He dug up the stones and he took out the weeds. He put a fence around it. He had done everything and expected good grapes. But he says all they're producing are worthless grapes. So what else is there to do, God says? But you just trample down that vineyard. You let it go. In chapter 5, verse 13, he says, Therefore, my people go into exile for their lack of knowledge. If you're filling out your outline, the first point in this book, the first five chapters have been Judah has rebelled and will be judged by being exiled. Isaiah has seen God as judge in the first five chapters. But in chapter six, he sees God as king. We're told it's the year King Uzziah died. And Isaiah sees God high and lifted up. He sees him exalted and he hears the angels saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. Isaiah, when he's in God's presence, sees himself and he says, woe is me. I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. On your outline, there are four C's. The first thing that happens to Isaiah when he's in God's presence is he's convicted of his sin. The second thing is he confesses it. He says, I am a man of unclean lips. He confesses that sin. And then we're told he's cleansed of his sin. An angel goes over to the altar, takes a coal, touches his lips, and says, you're forgiven. But because Isaiah is now clean of his sins, he can hear God's call. And we're told that God says, who shall I send? Who shall go for us? There's the Trinity of God. He doesn't say who will go for me, but who will go for us? And Isaiah says, here am I, send me. God does send Isaiah. In chapter 7, we're told that Ahaz is now king. And the northern kingdom of Israel has joined up with Syria and they are threatening Judah. They are about to attack Judah. God sends Isaiah to King Ahaz and says to him, Do not be afraid. Stay calm. Because Israel, which is called Ephraim in this passage, will be shattered and will no longer be a people. God is saying, you don't have to be afraid. I'm going to take care of Israel. Don't fear. He goes on to say, Ahaz, you can even ask me for a sign. Ahaz sounds, sounds very spiritual. He says, oh, I wouldn't want to test God by asking for a sign. Look what God says in chapter 7, verse 14. Right before that, he says, you're trying my patience. In other words, if I tell you to ask for a sign, it's not testing to ask me for a sign. It's obedience. In verse 14, he says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child, bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. We're told that there is an immediate fulfillment of that prophecy, that Isaiah's wife became pregnant. She had a son. And the next chapter tells us in verse 4 that God came and said before that child became old enough to say mama or dada that Israel would be carried away by the king of Assyria. Now see, God has already said Judah has been by exile. Now he says 
Israel has sinned and will be judged as well. This prophecy had an immediate fulfillment. Isaiah's wife became pregnant. But when we go to the New Testament, we find that this verse 14 is used to apply to Jesus. We're told that a virgin will have a, a son and will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And every one of the Gospels say that that applied to Jesus. You see, a prophet would foretell the future. But the book of Deuteronomy said that a prophet of God was accurate 100% of the time. Well, how would they know if the prophecy didn't take place for a thousand years? So there was always an immediate fulfillment and a long-range one. And that's what we see in this passage. Now, God has warned both the northern and southern kingdom they're going to be judged for their rebellion. And they're going to be judged by being under another government, under another nation. So in chapter 9, verse 6, he gives them great hope in the midst of this warning. He says, a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There'll be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. How awesome. God says, yes, you're going to be judged by being taken under another government, they're going to exile you to their land, but there's a new government coming. Jesus is coming. The child of, of a virgin is coming. He's both God and man. His name is Eternal Father, but he's bringing a government of peace. What hope, what encouragement that had to give the people. In the next chapters, he takes each of Judah's enemies and pronounces judgment on them. Ten nations have rebelled and will be judged. Babylon, Assyria, Edom, e Egypt. He lists ten different nations. But when we come to chapter 24, he says the entire earth has rebelled and will be judged. Chapter 24, verse 3. He says the earth will be completely laid waste. In verse 6, he says a curse will devour the earth, and those who live in it will be held guilty. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men are left. This hasn't happened yet, has it? There's never been a time when the entire earth has been judged by burning, but the day is coming. Judgment is coming. The message he's given us so far is Judah sinned, Israel sinned, ten nations sinned, the whole earth is sinned. We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all deserve to be judged. But he says this future judgment that's coming that judges the whole earth has a good purpose. In chapter 27, remember how Israel was called a vineyard that didn't produce any good fruit? Well, in this passage, he talks about that vineyard again. And down in verse 6, he says, In the days to come, Israel will blossom and sprout, and they will fill the whole world with fruit. See, God loves his people. In spite of their rebellion, he's not through. And he's going to judge the world in order to restore his people Israel. He wants them to be fruitful once more. There's a historical transition portion of this Old Testament part of the book of Isaiah. It starts in chapter 36 and 37. There are actually three stories about King Hezekiah. In chapters 36 and 37... Hezekiah has already seen Assyria take the northern kingdom of Israel off into captivity. He's already seen how cruel the Assyrians can be. 